after the first part of the inputs of the speakers, we will give the floor to you and you can pose questions and we can have a discussion. So what we are going to do now is that every speaker is going to provide an input of approximately 10 minutes, apart from Christian Fuchs, because already he provided with his input. And then we will give the floor to you for the questions. The first speaker is René Pfeiffer. He is an information technology expert with experience of over, over 20 years. He is also one of the main organizers of the annual DeepSec In-Depth Security Conference, which is a, con a conference dealing with technical aspects of communications. René also lectures at the Technicum Wien, and with this capacity, it is that he will provide us with uh, analysis on why surveillance and why all these things that we have been reading since June 2013, uh, after Snowden's revelations, why this is something that is important to everybody here and outside. The floor is to you. Let's wait. Ah, okay. So, uh, if you don't mind, I, I like to stand up and speaking because uh, at the end of my, my 10 minutes, I will tell you why we all should stand up to speak. <laughs> so, um, you have been aware of the growing surveillance which penetrates uh, our daily lives. And as uh, Dimitri said, uh, I come from a technical background. Uh, I deal with information security, which also covers a lot of communication that takes place in modern society. And uh, due to our conference, we have a very good overview on how technologies evolve, how they are used, and how people rely on this. So if you, if you uh, take a step back and if you look at the development of the internet in the past 20 years, uh, the internet has become a very widespread phenomenon which uses uh, many technologies and which also enters our private lives, as we have heard, our uh, work day or companies where we work for, uh, when we go shopping, it's ever present. If, if you take a look at the proliferation of smartphones, uh, you see people using smartphones every day, everywhere, where you can see. So communication is, the, is one of the key infrastructures uh, we use today, and it's also a basic need. Uh, people need to communicate, and this was uh, already the case before the internet. This means uh, communication is not only a business, it's, it's a part of our daily lives. And I wish to, to take a sidestep from the term surveillance and whistleblowing, because if you talk with a person, in person, if you meet someone, you usually have a certain kind of trust. If you meet someone in a cafe and you, you talk to them, you usually have a trustful atmosphere where you can at least uh, to some sense uh, rely on the fact that nobody has put up microphones on the table, has a video camera behind the bar or something like this, except maybe if you're in London. But uh, the point is uh, trust is the most important thing when it comes to communication because even if you, if you talk to a um, company clerk, if you go shopping and you have a question, you trust the person you talk to that he or she knows about products and can, can give you advice. So uh, we enter most communications with a certain level of trust and this is also uh, the reason why people share a lot uh, on the internet, unfortunately, because uh, if you talk to someone, even on Twitter or on Facebook, you usually have this, this trust built into you because you're talking to someone in your mind. But in reality, if you don't uh, check your privacy settings, you talk to the world and everyone can read this. So um, this trust issue has been uh, the most important aspect of the uh, leaks about the surveillance agencies we have seen since uh, summer last year. And this trust effectively has been destroyed 
Because if you look at the capabilities uh, that are used for, let's say, uh, gathering of information uh, and, and compromise of infrastructure, this trust has effectively been destroyed because almost any kind of information infrastructure used for communication or for your private use has come under attack. This doesn't stop at the network level because we have seen reports in the media about compromised hardware such as uh, laptops, tablets, smartphones, uh, whatever. So uh, this attack against the trust infrastructure of communication is very widespread. And this has an impact on some of us. Some people may not care, but they still have to trust the communication infrastructure. But this changes the way people communicate. Um, if you cannot trust in your communication infrastructure, you change the things you say. You, don't, you won't say everything anymore. You selectively uh, censor yourself. You think, maybe you think about what to share with others, what to talk on the telephone, what to say in public. And this is effectively uh, a destruction of the freedom of information, which we, we may not have yet, but uh, people censor themselves. Uh, this is very common if you are in a work environment, if you deal with non-disclosure agreements, you are used to this fact, but since last summer, this fact has entered the private lives of us all. Because we use phones daily, we use email daily, we, we use other means of communications daily, and uh, we cannot trust in these mechanisms anymore. We have to question ourselves, how secure is this method of communication? What does the company that runs the infrastructure promises us? We heard about the social media companies who also promise you can trust us with your data, we won't abuse it, but in fact there is abuse going on, either legal or illegal. And I would go so far as to, to say that uh, trusted entities, government entities and business entities, uh, have, uh, let's say, um, taken the tools of the cybercrime gangs and use them for their advantage. And this is a definitely break of the trust chain you have in the tools you use and in the daily communication you have. So my, my role at this panel here uh, will be not only the technical side, but uh, what I would like to know, if we come to the discussion point, if uh, this diminished trust in communication infrastructure has changed the way you use communication tools. I think this is a very interesting aspect because uh, we, we talk about freedom of information, but, but if you stop having the freedom to say what you want or to express your opinion at, before you even use uh, email uh, or chat or, or whatever technology, then you don't have a freedom of expression. And I would like to assess the impact which these revelations about uh, uh, espionage scandal has uh, on you and your way of life. So, uh, yeah, I think that's all I Thank wanted. You. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, interesting input and for opening our panel. Our next speaker now is uh, Professor Miyase Christensen, who is next to me. Uh, she is a professor of media and communication studies at Stockholm University, as well as a guest professor at the Department of uh, Philosophy and History of Technology, Science and Environment of the Royal Institute of Technology. In um, Miyase's research is interdisciplinary and focuses on thematic areas such as social theory perspectives on globalization processes and social change, technology, culture, and identity, and politics of popular communication. And Yasser will give us now a presentation titled Corporate Power, Social Surveillance, and Mediatized Geographies of Visibilities.
Can you hear me? Yes. For this presentation. Um, the theme of the panel is whistleblowing, but what I'm going to talk about has to do with the user end. And I think maybe we need whistleblowing on a smaller scale, telling us what's happening um, to our data as users. We heard a lot about uh, Edward Snowden and his blowing the whistle on the big brother. So this is, I think we also need to blow the whistle on little brothers and what's happening to our data online when we use these uh, technologies and social media. To sort of set the context in which I will talk about today, I should give a little bit of background information. What I'm going to talk about comes from a research project that myself and my research partner conducted in uh, Sweden over the past three, four years. And it is called Secure Spaces, uh, Media Consumption and Social Surveillance, which was funded by one of the funding agencies in, in Sweden. Um, the starting point for the project was that, one, the scale of surveillance has grown considerably. Of course, a lot has been written about surveillance, particularly top-down dimensions of surveillance, um, which is part of modernity, of course. Um, nation state is one of the complex, uh, most complex uh, forms uh, that we have created in modernity, and surveillance is integral to that, so a lot has been written about that. Um, in social theory, but in the recent years, 10, 15 years, uh, particularly the scale of surveillance has increased considerably, and monitoring and data storing changed in form and content. Formerly, we could differentiate between surveillance and data collation. Today, data collation translates into surveillance because of uh, the nature of technologies. So that was one of the starting points. And what we tried to do in this project was to look at how individuals, people, deal with uh, these technologies and monitoring and surveillance that come with that. Because we know the top-down story, and it looks ugly. There's a lot of surveillance, corporate surveillance, uh, commercial surveillance, and also state and military surveillance. But when we look at the user end, of course, uh, the immediate sort of assumption is that this gives us a lot of uh, freedom, but it also comes with a lot of control. So we wanted to find out how people understand or don't understand what are the perceptions and how they make use of these technologies and how they grapple with these issues in their everyday lives. That was the starting uh, point of the project, to see what the implications of this are. And I will get to the specifics in a minute, but to sort of uh, come from general to specific, um, what I think is that surveillance that comes with uh, social media and other online and mobile applications today creates a culture of compliant exchange, or complicit surveillance, as I call it. Meaning, one way or the other, we as users, individuals, of course, we are uh, citizens turned into consumers, we are made complicit in surveillance on a larger scale. Because we have a gift economy, we have um, supermarket cards that give us discounts and better deals, and we can multiply the examples like that. And we get uh, free, communication uh, media and devices through social media such as Facebook, which uh, collect and sell our data, but it's another example of gift economy. At the end of the day, we get to use these services for free. So one way or the other, we're taking part in that. But of course, as I will get to later um, in my short talk, this is not to suggest that the blame or the responsibility is to be put on the users or the user end. But nonetheless, these are important and significant, of course. Um, and we increasingly, more and more, rely on abstract systems, what Anthony Giddens calls abstract systems. What are abstract systems? They are, for instance, um, flying. We don't know anything about planes, but we put our trust in that. We put our lives and we fly. And we put our trust in the banking system. We don't really know, you know what's going on behind the scenes. And the same is true for media. Media are increasingly more and more abstract systems, such as Facebook. It's obscure, but nonetheless, we put our trust there. Just like I put myself on a plane without knowing how that machine flies, um, I put my trust in the uh, social media, Facebook, and use that, because there are benefits that come with that. There's also, of course, social pressure, professional pressure, and, and private pressure to use these technologies. So we more and more rely on these systems which come with a lot of implications. And I think when we're looking at the user end, um, we need to understand this in terms of the constellation of 
the market, which is network global capitalism, the media, which are increasingly more and more um, integral to our professional daily uh, private lives, and also a geopolitics of fear. Today it's 9-11, the fear of terrorism, the bombings. Yesterday it was the Cold War, but nonetheless there is a sort of encapsulating culture of fear and distrust, which also um, has implications in terms of the ways in which individuals, users understand uh, comes with these technologies. So market, media, and um, a geopolitics of fear and distrust are the parameters or the constellation, the thematic constellations within which we need to understand what's happening at the user end. And I would say um, this constellation imposes upon us a neoliberal sense of social presence. We need to be there, otherwise we're excluded, and self-achievement. When we look at our daily lives in the urban environment, there's an aesthetics of security, gated communities and things like that. So this is sort of like the assemblage within which we need to understand what's happening at the user end. We have our data doubles on um, social media, on Facebook. And quite frankly, yes, it's us, it's me on Facebook, but it's not me. I wouldn't post things on my window, but I, I do that on, on Facebook. So we need to think about it in those terms as well. So to get to uh, the study itself, what we did was, over the course of three, four years, we interviewed people. And these were qualitative interviews, and we also had a quantitative nationwide uh, survey to understand what the attitudes are um, on the user hand towards these technologies. And this um, included, including my own site study, which was associated with the project, about 50 interviews with people living in urban areas, um, upper middle class, also people who are um, who have migrant backgrounds in, in, in Stockholm urban area. We looked, looked at uh, small town settings as well, trying to cover different factions of, of the society to see what the attitudes are. And I couldn't help but smile throughout the uh, closing address yesterday by Eric, because basically we are doing exactly what he was telling us not to do as users. Even though there is some awareness, of course, it, it is dependent on uh, socioeconomic class, class education, etc. cetera, uh, we often tend to disregard that. Okay, there is surveillance, they are collecting my data, they are using it for commercial purposes, but at the end of the day, I'm using these services for free, so I don't, I don't want to think about it, or I tend not to think about it. This is, to put it in a nutshell, of, in a very simplistic uh, way, of course, it's not that simple, and, and some users have more awareness, but overall, uh, what came out of the interviews was that people either, ha either have very little awareness of, of the kind of surveillance uh, that come with these technologies and the fact that our data are being used uh, for commercial purposes, or they tend not to think about it. Because Many um, people we interviewed said, okay, if I think too much about it, I cannot use these technologies and I need to use these technologies. And what also came out of the study, which I think is very interesting, and I put it in terms of external versus um, internal technology, people tend to be more wor worried about camera surveillance. And they pointed to, I, when we asked them, okay, what do you consider to be uh, surveillance and what is pro problematic from your point of view? And oftentimes they pointed to camera surveillance. And they said, well, they wouldn't want, uh, some said they wouldn't want surveillance in, in, in public areas. Some said, well, it's better to have uh, surveillance in public areas because it prevents crime, etc." And some said they were worried about surveillance um, at airports if there's body scanning or um, in the fitting rooms in, in, in stores or in, in public areas where they don't want to be surveilled by cameras. But most of our uh, informants, people we interviewed, showed little to none uh, awareness or concern when it comes to mobile phones because they see it as internal technology, almost part of our bodies. And they really do not think, tend to think about it as, as, as surveilling devices, which is quite worrying, of course. Or when you tell, well, but there, these are the features that comes with these, uh, come with these technologies, then, then they said, well, if I don't have anything to hide, 
then I shouldn't really be worried about it. Who would bother to surveil me uh, through my mobile phone? But of course, as we know, as the technology is getting more sophisticated, for instance, if your iPhone is stolen, you can remotely take the picture of the thief or wherever the camera is pointed to without the thief even um, noticing that. That's one example. Of course, at the user end, most people would say, yeah, that's great, isn't it? Then I can track my thief. But it, it, it's not just that, is it? It, it comes with enormous social implications and, and historical contingencies. And that's just one example. Think the, the kind of sophisticated um, um, applications that come with these technologies is just mind-blowing. So I'm not able to, unfortunately, in this short talk to go into the specifics of the study, and I think it was very interesting, but we uh, published our results in this book called Media Surveillance and Identity Social Perspectives, uh, which includes some of my colleagues here. Um, to conclude, again, I would like to point out the importance of thinking the market, global network of capitalism, the media, and the geopolitics of uh, power and distrust together, and these, the, the kind of trust we put in abstract systems to understand both the production and the user end, um, and the social implications that comes with these technologies. Um, the end result is that one, many of us have little to none awareness of what's going on. Yes, there is the fine print of privacy terms and conditions on, on Facebook, but as advocacy groups and consumer rights groups point out, one, who reads that? Second, there are very young users and they don't even understand the implications of that. So we cannot put the responsibility and the blame on the user, user side. Um, and second, even if we are aware of uh, surveillance and its implications, we oftentimes concede to uh, using these technologies, thinking we, we simply cannot be excluded professionally and privately from these technologies. Um, I think at the end of the day, what needs to be uh, point out, pointed out is the fact that, one, we need laws and regulations, and if you're talking about in the context of Europe, then we need supranational EU-level laws and regulations, and of course they should translate into national-level uh, legislation and, 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 and enforcement. Second, uh, we need really strong advocacy groups, civil rights organizations and also consumer advocacy groups to be able to uh, cope with, which, uh, with what's going on. And this is not to say that we should stop using these technologies. Of course, it's another form of social space and a lot of our activities and daily lives migrated onto, the, onto that social space, but we just need to be able to um, better grapple with that and, and, and deal with that on a social level. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you very much, Miyase. Uh, you have already covered some of my questions around important issues uh, regarding surveillance perceptions and uh, the behavior of citizens. Uh, we move on now to the third speaker, uh, who is Sebastian Sevignani. Would you like to, to put your slide? Yes. Um, Sebastian is, uh, holds currently a postdoctoral position at the Friedrich Schiller University of Vienna in Germany. In the past, uh, he has studied communication, philosophy, and theology at the University of Salzburg. And he recently earned his PhD that was related to the commodification of privacy and personal data. Based on this experience, he will now provide us with a presentation around uh, privacy discourses and the commodification of personal data. Yeah, thank you, Dimitri, for the uh, introduction. Um, my topic is the question if uh, privacy is really the opponent uh, to, to surveillance. Um, yeah, in the, in the next uh, 10 minutes. Um, Edward Snowden uh, revealed by sharing secret documents and data with an investigative journalist um, the existence of previously unknown secret service programs such as PRISM, Tempora, and uh, Fairview. 
these programs aim at the, as we know, extensive surveillance of global communication flows. Uh, usually the value of privacy is invoked to oppose uh, such surveillance and oppose these programs. Uh, in this talk, I however want to go a different path and uh, pose the question whether privacy is really uh, the opponent to surveillance. Mm. In order to do so, it is, uh, as a first step, important to see that most um, of Snowden's revelations clearly show that there is a strong cooperation uh, between corporations on the one hand and the state on, on the other hand in terms of surveillance. And Christian uh, Fuchs has, has already mentioned this um, surveillance in this in the industrial uh, complex. Um, um, this cooperation may be either voluntary and or actively enabled by uh, uh, laws. Economic and political surveillance are strongly intertwined in our societies. Uh, I want to focus here on the often neglected economic aspects of surveillance um, that enables much of the political surveillance and uh, uh, leads to, to problems of privacy. Mm, my first argument uh, is that surveillance is an inherent quality of um, gaining profits in informational capitalist societies. Such societies are, amongst others, uh, characterized by the right to private property in the means of communication. Um, the profit and the competition principle necessitates uh, the vast collection of all sorts of data for advertising or more pro broadly uh, spoken uh, marketing purposes. The aim is always to reduce the uncertainty uh, that a commodity which was produced cannot be uh, sold in the, in the last instance. Uh, through the application of immense surveillance means for this purpose, it regularly comes to a privacy crisis. Uh, we know this, for instance, in the context of Facebook, a prototypical player in the corporate internet. Uh, and a recent example in this context is uh, Facebook, uh, Facebook's uh, acquisition uh, of the messenger service WhatsApp and the great increase of user numbers for alternative messenger services that uh, followed right after uh, the acquisition um, became public. So at the first glance and common to our understanding, uh, there is a contradiction between privacy and surveillance. Uh, when personal data is uh, subjected to um, commodification in the corporate internet. Mm. At the second glance, however, privacy, the alleged opponent to surveillance, is, uh, also has, just like economic surveillance has, strong relations to private property. My second argument here is that the dominant notion of privacy is a possessive individualistic one. Uh, yeah. And Christian also mentioned this, uh, the, 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 influence, uh, the, the, the relevance of possessive individualistic notions of freedom uh, in our societies. Um, within capitalism, it is useful and necessary that the indiv individual uh, perceives herself or himself as essentially the proprietor uh, of his or her own person and capacities, for which he then owes nothing to society. Mm, consequently, the individ individual is then uh, able to, inter, uh, to enter into self-interested relations with others. So that's, that's uh, a short characterization of possessive individualism. Um, the well-known uh, law professor and political activist uh, Lawrence Lessig says that just as the individual who is concerned about privacy uh, and wants to control who gets access to what and when, uh, also, the copyright holder wants to control who gets access to what and when. Um, um, this uh, privacy as property approach, uh, defended by Lawrence Lessig and others, uh, demands that everyone uh, possesses his or her own reput uh, reputation and data images. Uh, and hence, everyone wins the absolute rights that come with the institution of private property in, in, in our society. Um, today, there is the influential argument that new technological, uh, technologi technological uh, developments such as cloud computing, uh, chain informatization, ambient intelligence have rendered data flows too complicated. Uh, uh, data flows too complicated, and also the relations between the actors in them too complicated to be addressed by existing privacy laws. I think this uh, this argument uh, makes 
the thinking of personal data and privacy as private property even more influential today. Um, it follows then from my line of argumentation that there are common grounds between surveillance and property. And this puts a question mark over the opposition of the two terms. Yeah, the, the displayed uh, quote from, from Facebook's uh, terms of use contains in essence uh, the, the issues I'm con concerned about and I'm talking about here. Uh, it concisely presents the property privacy relations in informational capitalism um, that I would describe as a practical and discursive uh, commodification. In the corporate information econom economy, users have, like workers generally have in capitalism, a double freedom. Um, on the one hand, they are uh, usually free from ownership of the internet services, uh, uh, but, on, uh, but on the other hand, uh, they, um, they are free to exchange their personal data with, for example, Facebook or Google, um, because they hold a property right in. Uh, for instance, the user must contractually accept Facebook's data use policy and thereby grants, uh, grants extensive permissions that his or her data is used for advertising purposes. One can speak here, uh, as I think, um, as of a discursive com commodification of privacy, um, which means to make private the understanding of privacy um, yeah, coherent to the framework of uh, possessive individualism. Uh, on this takes place simultaneously and uh, uh, supports uh, as such the practical commodifi commodification that, um, for example, Facebook uh, does. Mm, I think the commodification of privacy is um, linked to two major problems. Um, first, uh, the double freedom of the internet user is linked uh, to the problem of um, alienation or structural heteronomy. Uh, on the social level, the profit and market principle uh, perpetually forces marketers to disrespect privacy. Also, privacy is uh, uh, declared as an important value in liberal societies. Um, on the individual level, this contradiction is also, uh, we can also uh, observe this contradiction. Um, for, for, for instance, in uh, so-called privacy trade-offs, um, um, we we uh, suspend privacy voluntarily when we use uh, when we uh, use Facebook, but uh, nobody is uh, forced to to use Facebook. Face, uh, Facebook, but we do it. Uh, we do it. Also, we are not really confident with uh, with the the, the uh, suspension of privacy at this moment. Uh, and the second problem uh, is, um, in my view, that. Um, Internet corporations use personal data uh, provided by the users um, to gain profits. Um, and I think there is a circle where profits uh, for the owners of these services create power asymmetries uh, that in turn make um, uh, further, further profits and further power asymmetries uh, possible. Uh, there are of course various forms of power, monetary, network power, symbolic power, and these forms of power are unequally distributed distributed be between the majority of the users and the internet capitalists uh, and are then mobilized to preserve the status quo and again here the acquisition of WhatsApp uh, by Facebook is a good example um, in this context. Um, if my observations are correct uh, so far then um, the struggle against surveillance and for privacy must be seen in a more nuanced way. Uh, awareness of the described nexus in informational capitalism calls, in my view, for alternative movements to struggle against surveillance, uh, other than uh, simply insisting uh, on the value of privacy, privacy as it stands. What is needed, in my view, is a decommodification of privacy. And this entails, on the one hand, practical struggles and support for alternative, non-commercial communication services, such as Diaspora, Wikipedia, SIA, or Telegram. Uh, on the other hand, it would entail also a rethinking of privacy. Uh, privacy should be rethought as a social concept um, that is not oriented to negative freedom, but oriented to concrete socio-historical freedom. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, there is not enough time to unfold this, 
uh, and I, I will finish here and thank you for your uh, attention. Um, uh, sorry, again, one small request. Uh, unless you have something important, uh, unless you have an important reason to use the internet, we would like to kindly ask you not to use, if possible, the internet because we have been facing some problems with uh, streaming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for your very thought-provoking presentation around the commodification of privacy. We move now to the fourth presenter, who is Minas Matas from Greece. Minas is a professor of political sociology at the sociology department of the University of Crete in Creta. Minas has earned a PhD in sociology from the New School for Social Research in New York. He has published extensively academic articles and books around surveillance and society. And in particular, he is the author of the book Surveillance in Greece, From Anti-Communist to Consumer Surveillance, and the co-editor of the book Surveillance and Democracy. And based on this experience, he will speak to us today about surveillance in Greece in times of austerity and the crisis. Thank you, Dimitri. Uh, thank you all, and uh, uh, I am grateful for the invitation and apologize uh, from the beginning that uh, many of you have heard a lot of about Greece uh, the first day of the, of the conference, and I'll try not to be uh, redundant, but just to supplement some angles of uh, the uh, so-called uh, uh, Greek case, which is not an isolated uh, uh, case, but uh, it has to do with uh, uh, democracy and civil liberties in Europe. Um, let me uh, tell you also that uh, I'm against uh, <coughs> the so-called Greek exceptionalist, that is, uh, that, uh, you know, the trend to present Greece as a, a particular exceptional case. Uh, I'm trying to compare uh, Greece with other um, uh, post-authoritarian societies in Southern Europe, and now with uh, post-authoritarian in Central East, uh, uh, post-Soviet uh, uh, European uh, societies, because Greece is, uh, uh, to remind you, is uh, uh, a post-authoritarian surveillance society, which uh, uh, has, uh, uh, which had uh, a, a bloody civil war uh, at, uh, at the end of, uh, 40s after the World War II, and then we had a, a very uh, oppressive police state, uh, which ended to a naked military dictatorship until 1974. And uh, <clears throat> thanks uh, to the struggles of the Greek people and uh, the disaster catastrophe at Cyprus, we gained to have a parliamentary democracy uh, since 1974 to date which unfortunately was led by populist uh, uh, political parties. So it was somehow foreseen, uh, it was predictable that we would have uh, uh, economic and financial uh, uh, problems, but nobody could uh, foresee the humanitarian crisis that Greek people are experiencing uh, these uh, last years. And I, I, my colleagues uh, from Greece and myself, although we are not a coherent group, we are here to report uh, to, to, to you that um, uh, Greek people actually uh, resist the, uh, let's say, the austerity regime led by the Troika, that is, uh, that is Germany, EU, and Americans. And uh, hopefully we, uh, with the solidarity of the European uh, people will restore democracy and prosperity in Greece, uh, which is a hope for the whole Europe, for a new Europe, a people's Europe. So after this uh, introduction, let me tell you that uh, uh, the legacy of this oppressive uh, authoritarian surveillance in uh, previous years has, uh, a, a, let's say, has a, a dubious legacy for current uh, 
uh, Greeks' uh, attitude towards uh, state surveillance. Uh, Greek citizens oppose any kind of state surveillance, including institutional, legitimate forms of surveillance, like for uh, taxes, uh, medical records, and et cetera, et cetera, because they consider that the state authorities are not trustworthy. And there are lots of uh, evidences to prove that uh, actually we have an institutional gap and uh, the, the lack, the deficit of trust to the state authorities is uh, uh, to a certain extent uh, justified. At the same time, especially the young generations uh, care less for privacy. Privacy in the Greek culture is not uh, a worth value and uh, you can see uh, the, let's say, the Aegean uh, island uh, uh, architecture which actually reflects uh, you know, uh, uh, coherent uh, social groups without uh, fear of privacy. The problem is with the state surveillance, which uh, classifies, used to classify people, all citizens, regardless of uh, their political affiliations and their beliefs, uh, classifying according to political criteria to, uh, to enforce discipline and loyalty to the regime. This legacy has made has these uh, uh, consequences in current Greece even before the crisis. Now, uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, and uh, we do this in sociology, we care more about uh, state and corporations who collect uh, data, exploit data, make these profiles to, uh, you know, to, 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 to use them for various uh, purposes. Uh, and uh, we don't really care about much about the relative issue of privacy because it is not really the issue, especially under the austerity crisis uh, conditions. Uh, let me briefly uh, report a few, 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 uh, few data and uh, conclude uh, in, the, uh, in the limited time I have. Um, a significant, uh, we, we observe uh, during this, uh, those last uh, years of the, uh, under the austerity crisis and the austerity regime, a, a significant uh, high rocketing increase of legal phone interceptions by the state authorities, uh, first rate in the whole, uh, maybe in the whole, uh, let's say, democratic world, Western world. Uh, it's estimated that uh, uh, the, the legal, uh, by, let's say, by the juridical authorities allowed, permitted uh, interceptions are around 50,000 uh, uh, telephone numbers and uh, uh, you can imagine uh, if, you, if you include their uh, addresses and the network of each number uh, that uh, we're talking about uh, a proportionate, a big proportionate uh, uh, of uh, uh, legal interceptions. Uh, as you understand, we also have uh, illegal phone tappings, not only by state authorities, but also by private uh, uh, institutions, corporations, and individuals, which are, of course, unknown to be estimated. Uh, police internet tracking is justified to avert uh, pedophiles and cyberbullying, but also, and mainly, targets those who are opposed to the austerity regime, activists, uh, civil society groups, etc., and uh, uh, not only the extreme political parties, but also all opposition parties. Blatant violations of personal data, I should say that there is not a really serious protection of personal data, because we have the phenomenon of, of uh, uh, posting uh, various online lists of names, thousands of public servant names to be removed or fired. Uh, online list of uh, uh, taxpayers who are unable to pay their uh, taxes. Um, not only those HIV uh, women, allegedly sex workers, but of ordinary people who for some reasons are classified, are classified by various criteria uh, to be a candidate for or let's say def uh, daily defamation by the media as uh, not uh, 
be a good citizens. Uh, I'm talking about professional groups, lawyers, academics, uh, you know, other professional groups who are massively portrayed as tax evaders, but lazy and corrupted citizens. It's a, a, it's, a, it's a policy, it's a strategic policy of the austerity regime to defame the majority of the Greek people as uh, lazy and corrupted so that to construct consent for this draconian austerity policy. The only list that was hided, concealed, and tried to be out of the public debate was the so-called Lagarde, Lagarde list, which was given by uh, Mrs. Lagarde to uh, Greek authorities, including, uh, comprising by, uh, you know, uh, tax evaders, mostly the elite, tax, uh, Greek elite uh, tax evaders who have their money in Switzerland and other offshore uh, uh, destinations. That uh, Lagarde elite, which, from which the Greek authorities could get uh, enough money uh, was really concealed and the, uh, the journalist who publicized it uh, was persecuted, uh, was uh, prosecuted and uh, uh, hopefully, uh, fortunately, he was uh, uh, not uh, sent to jail. Um, uh, we also observe police coercive uh, actions against uh, uh, not only uh, protesters and activists, but uh, also against high school teach, uh, students, high school students who had made a sort of uh, demonstrations or occupied the schools to protest the austerity policy in education, and also doctors who protest the austerity policies in hospitals and so forth and so called. And uh, we have, as you may know, the total surveillance and uh, police coercion in northern Greece at the region of uh, Scurries where people uh, have a movement against the gold mines, the Canadian gold mines, which actually will uh, destroy the environment and uh, won't really uh, give uh, money to the Greek, uh, um, to the Greek uh, uh, economy. Uh, I will, um, I will uh, like to conclude with uh, two, two, two significant cases. During the Olympics, Athens 2004 Olympics, uh, it was, uh, uh, let's say, a case, it was an opportunity for corrupted uh, Greek politicians to have a tango party, uh, to have a, a really, uh, you know, uh, uh, a corrupted uh, fest with uh, those who uh, you know, uh, especially German uh, corporations who sold uh, infrastructures for the security of the Olympics. So, uh, uh, let's say I'm talking about the notorious case of uh, Siemens uh, Corporation, which uh, uh, was subcontracted uh, the security system C4I by the American SAIC, and who uh, has been, uh, uh, Siemens has accepted that gave 2% of its revenues uh, from overpriced uh, system to Greek uh, political uh, politicians and officials to uh, ensure uh, the profitable uh, Olympic uh, uh, contracts. This, is, this uh, corrupt uh, policy of Siemens uh, was uh, uh, proved in the courts in New York and uh, in, uh, in Munich. And uh, I'm, I mention this because uh, Siemens, even in Nigeria, and uh, I'm not uh, talking uh, uh, negatively about Nigeria. Nigeria succeeded a very heavy penalty against Siemens, an apology of uh, Siemens uh, for this uh, corrupted policy uh, uh, to, to, to gain contracts. In Greece, until recently, Siemens has a monopoly status, has an arrogant monopoly uh, status, uh, being able to, 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 to blackmail uh, the Greek government, actually having uh, data for those who are corrupted and still rule the country, and uh, managed to have a settlement, which is ridiculous, uh, to uh, will give just, uh, I think, 120 million back to Greece. Part of uh, this money will go for anti-corruption seminars to Greeks, okay? I repeat, Siemens, with this corrupted history and culture, will teach Greeks uh, about uh, uh, you know uh, honesty and uh, 
business without corruption. I just mentioned this because it's really a, a ridiculous uh, settlement uh, and uh, I'm, I, I, as Greeks we are ashamed for our governments accepting this uh, you know, uh, outrageous settlement. The other thing I would like briefly to mention and finish is that during the Olympics we also had uh, uh, you know, uh, phone taps of the entire uh, Greek government and the political and military elite, uh, which was at that time the government was conservative and uh, very much pro-American. So speculations were, uh, were uh, at that time that yes, it was by the American embassy and uh, of course uh, protect the Greek uh, interests, nothing was uh, happened to to, 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 to reveal or to, let's say, to condemn the Americans. After Snowden's revelations, which uh, confirmed that actually NSA made this dirty business, not only, not only of course in Greece, but especially in Greece, almost uh, a year and a half during and after the Olympics, the, uh, the ridiculous governments of Greece said nothing, did nothing, and the, let's say, the austerity uh, supported press covered uh, Snowden very little, uh, very little, and uh, without any any kind of uh, uh, let's say support about that. Uh, uh, those two uh, those two uh, let's say uh, uh, cases uh, reflect how weak the Greek uh, austerity regime is, how uh, the let's say the German patrons of uh, Greece right now uh, have. Uh, uh, have tried to, to enforce this uh, uh, drastic austerity regime, and uh, we have to say, uh, based on the resilience and resistance of the Greek people, that uh, the laboratory, the Greek laboratory, the Greek austerity laboratory has failed. Uh, the test against uh, Greek democracy, Greek society, and not only Greek economy, has blatantly failed, of course, leaving ruins in Greek society, Greek economy, Greek uh, education, Medicare, and so forth, and so forth. That is why it must stop immediately. And the prospect is, uh, you know, starting these uh, Euro elections. Uh, from these Euro elections, we aspire and we expect a European solidarity to uh, change Europe, because without a change in Europe, uh, Greek, uh, Greek society will be very weak to restore uh, democracy. So uh, I finish here, and uh, I would like to thank you for your patience listening to me. Thank you very much, Minas, for presenting us this case study. And I wanted to make a comment that I agree with what you said in the beginning, that Greece is not an exception, and there are many uh, uh, other countries in Europe where such practices are taking place. So we move now to our last uh, speaker, Pepi Zavodsky, um, an experienced systems administrator. In his job, Pepi helps companies, organizations, and individuals to, with IT security, privacy, and user training. Pepe is also an anonymity advocate and one of the co-organizers of the Crypto Party in Vienna. And the Crypto Party, for those who don't know it, is a, an international initiative that educates the wider public on how to uh, protect themselves online and how to be anonymous. And I would like to kindly ask you to uh, stay within the limits in order to have more time for discussion afterwards. Thank you. Um, I might not have a lot of answers for you, but I do have a lot of questions. Um, maybe questions that you should ask yourselves. So who of you uh, is using email? Raise of hands if you're using email. Who of, you, of, of those who just raised their hands is using encrypted email? Significantly less. Still more than I expected, though, <laughs> which is good. Yes. Um, are you using chat like Amazon or AIM or Skype or something like that? 
Yeah. Let's proprietary networks um, that are data silos. You're using them. Um, who's running a website? Who has a website of you? Their own website. Are you using HTTPS only for that site? Oh, well, that's very few. <laughs> so, all of the most of these communications you, we just talked about, they're plain text. They're not encrypted, they're not protected. Anyone on the internet can snoop in on them and read what you're talking about with your friends, with your colleagues, with your significant other. There, of course, is a strong peer pressure to use the same network, the same technology, the same data silo as your friends, because you want to communicate with them. As Renee said, there's a, a, a need, a cultural need to communicate with your peers, and, with, and your peers are spread out on the planet nowadays. Um, so there are multiple problems with this. First, many, many people in tech were laughed about for many years about well, this is insecure. Somebody could read your emails. Somebody could read your data. Um, now we know these people were right. They were not sitting there with their tinfoil hats and laughed at. They were right. And now we know that they were right. We have, we have proof that they were right. So global surveillance is a phenomenon, um, a corporate and a governmental phenomenon, that is possible because we let them snoop on us. It's, it's easy. Everything, most of the communication is plain text, so you just sit there and watch the data flow by and read what's in there and make your analysis and uh, draw whatever conclusions you want to draw. It's the interpretation that's dangerous there. So, I have a privilege. I know how to secure my communications, at least I think I know. And. One of the, the major problems with this is that security is invisible. So is insecurity. You cannot see that somebody on a network switch miles away, kilometers away, hundreds of them, is reading your, da your data, your traffic. You cannot see that person. So there is nobody to not trust, as we heard. Trust is a very personal thing. And if you meet in person, you can trust or distrust on a certain level. You cannot distrust somebody or, uh, administering a network. You don't see that person. You don't, usually don't realize that they are there. Security is a given. You expect security, but you don't have it. That's a problem. Um, so to solve these problems, people need to change. People need to change their habits. This is a very hard thing to do. Technology needs to change. We do have technology that can secure our communications. It's already there. It has been there for 10 years, for 15 years, even longer maybe. Yet we still use technology that enables surveillance. Um, you often hear, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. Who of you has nothing to hide? anyone. It's true. You do have something to hide, which is your dignity, which is your privacy. And you do want to hide that. Yet on the internet you don't. You wouldn't hand a stranger your mobile phone with, and let them read your communication. You wouldn't do that. You maybe close your curtains at night. So what can technology do here? Um, technology is able to secure communications if you want to use it. But technology is only a short-term solution at the moment. It's a patch, a patch on a global problem. And the crypto party movement, it's, it's a worldwide movement to, to teach anybody the proper use of securing technologies for communications like email, like chat, to move away from proprietary and commercial data silos to open standards that can, that can interoperate. It all sounds scary, 
but there's a ton of people, and some of, uh, of them are in this room, um, who are doing the, the crypto parties all over the planet in several hundred cities uh, of the world to teach people how to immediately improve the security of their communications. It, sometimes, yeah, the technology involves a lot of math and is complex, but you don't need to understand the math in, de in depth to use the technology. And you should use it. And it's usually quite easy to learn. What these people cannot take away from you is the, the willingness to learn and to go there and take part of it and, and talk to these people. Of course, um, we need to change the commercial side, the product side. Can we trust this device? I'm not sure. Even the experts who have dug deep into the tech and the devices, they often cannot really tell if this is really secure if, or if there's something broken with it. So how is everybody supposed to tell that it is secure? You can go to an event and have uh, people teach you and tell you about this. Um, so you break down the trust level to the personal level again and not trust somebody who says, well, our product is secure, of course it is. It's here in our shiny marketing pamphlet. Be suspicious if you see something like that. Be suspicious if a product is free, a service is free to use. It usually means it's free as in beer for you, but there's nothing like free as in freedom there to see. Because you are the product. It's you being sold by the companies. Um, so the technology can give us a short-term patch aid to secure our communications. In the long term, we need legislation uh, and tear down the data silos and, and vote with our wallets and uh, not use the companies that sell us as a product. So we need to change our society and we need to change products to be private by design and not not private thank you very much pepe for this introduction into the whole um, methodology and idea behind crypto party um, I would like now to pass the floor to you and see whether there are any questions before I pose some questions that I would like to yes please My question is in response to um, Christian Fuchs and maybe also Sebastian Sevignani. Um, you, were, you were talking about these different concepts of freedom, the property freedom and the social freedom, which amounts to equality, really. And um, so um, for me, the question arises there, if not surveillance, like what, what is the, the, um, the function of surveillance here? Is it, um, is it not an intrinsic factor of the rise of inequality? And with surveillance, it's sold to us as a sort of safety measure. And my question is, is it not rather um, more, of, uh, does it not rather have a function of control? Um, yeah, maybe you can say something about this. Thank you. Would you like to respond now? Ah, it's good. Okay. Yeah, I can respond to this. Uh, I think you're right that control uh, is important. And of course, I would say surveillance is one specific form uh, of control uh, that has to do with the way uh, we deal uh, with, uh, uh, in, with information. I mean, we would probably have to discern also other 
forms uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of control. And what I would say is that surveillance necessarily is built into the structures uh, of modern society, both economic surveillance and state surveillance. At the same time, I think also uh, socioeconomic inequality is built into the very structures uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of modern society. And uh, so the surveil we have on the one hand necessarily the surveillance of the citizen uh, by governments uh, in, uh, in modern societies because there's a power differential uh, between governments uh, and citizens uh, because uh, we have liberal democracies and not participatory uh, democracies where this power differential would, uh, would, uh, would fade to, uh, to exist. And we have uh, in the economy a power differential uh, between uh, owners uh, of private property and the means of, uh, of productions uh, on the one side and employees uh, and uh, consumers uh, on the other hand, which necessarily necessita necessitates uh, that we uh, have the, uh, the surveillance uh, of uh, employees, different forms of employee surveillance uh, at the workplace. Uh, and, con and, and, and consumer surveillance. So modern society, I mean, uh, and what, I mean, what makes modern society very specific are on the one hand uh, the modern state and on the other hand the capitalist corporation. Given that these are, I mean, I would say these are two main modern uh, institutions. Uh, given that they exist within power inequalities, uh, the uh, surveillance, these two forms, economic and political surveillance, necessarily exist within this uh, this, uh, this, uh, this framework. Uh, how to overcome it uh, is only by creating a society and the framework for society where the power inequalities uh, are, are overcome. Yeah? yeah, what I would say. Thank you very much for this. Yes, please. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Mata Simsalha. I am doing my PhD at the University of Manchester in Middle Eastern Studies. I have many questions to each one of you, but because there is no time, I will ask maybe one or two. Please ask one and let us proceed to the discussion and then according to our time. Okay. I, will, I want to ask the last speaker. Do you really believe that there is a way to protect uh, your communication? If the CIA wants to get your communication, would they find it hard to track your record? Thank you. Well, if I w wouldn't believe in secure communication, I wouldn't be doing Crypto Party for more than uh, 20 times now, 18 times now, something like that. Or you just could just call me plain stupid. Um, <laughs> if you're personally targeted by an intelligence agency, you probably have more severe problems than securing your communications. Uh, the intention of um, crypto party and teaching people to use more secure channels, not necessarily absolutely secure channels because they don't exist, but to raise the security of the global communication. At the moment we're giving away a lot of plain text for free and we're just handing it over. Just take it, please, surveil us. If the standard is encrypted communication, it gets a lot harder to surveil on a broad scale and surveil everyone. If you're personally targeted, there's still things you can do, but that will be very hard because you have a, a very superior opponent. But at the moment, the, the goal is not to protect a, one individual from the state, but to protect everyone from global surveillance. And that certainly is possible. I have an additional answer to this. Um, there's a lot of talk about cryptography and, and, and technology which helps you to protect yourself. But if, if your threat level gets higher, you also need to change your behavior. This means secure communication still works and there are ways to do this. But if you're targeted by a high profile adversary, you have to also change your environment, your behavior, and a lot more than just encrypt your emails. 
Thank you very much. And I would like to add also that the idea behind this movement is that if a lot of people within the society start using this kind of security tools, and in general, if they start being more careful about what they post online or what they disclose when they are speaking on the phone, then it would be more difficult for those intelligent uh, agencies to collect and assess information about the whole population. And this is the idea behind this. So is there any other question, uh, please? Um, I'm a journalist for the Austrian newspaper Falte, and I have one question for Christian Fuchs. Um, I found your idea very interesting of public service broadcasters as an alternative model for the internet. But I wonder, isn't one of the main problems nowadays that the um, internet was built by libertarians, people who so radically are against the idea of a state um, that they built this into core elements of the internet and also into the, I would say, internet ideology, as well as that the basic notion online nowadays still is libertarian. And if you look at many organizations, also at WikiLeaks and other organizations, that you still have this um, notion that the state should keep out of everything. Yes, I think that's a very good question. And you, I mean, I would even like to radicalize your question. You could say my idea of the public service internet would make it even easier for the NSA uh, and other state uh, intelligence agencies to access the data, so how to respond uh, to this. Uh, and also it's true, I mean, I've conducted a survey among activists, how they think about, I mean, and media activists uh, within the Occupy movement, uh, but this is not published uh, yet, it will be published in a book called uh, Occupy Media. Uh, and they are very skeptical uh, about uh, the idea that the state should uh, play a stronger role uh, on uh, the, in the internet, and they very much like the idea, I mean, they, they like the idea of an alternative platforms, uh, but if you ask them, should there be state funding for alternative uh, platforms, they don't like the idea. They like the idea of donations, like uh, Wikipedia and so on. But I fear if we only rely on civil society organizations that run platforms like Wikipedia uh, and, uh, and uh, and, uh, and, and so on. I fear that this is not enough. So I think we need this part of the alternatives, yeah? platforms run and controlled by civil society uh, on the one hand, but at the same time, I think we um, must be critical of the state, but act against the state within the state. Yeah? So I would not say uh, that we need a pure civil society politics. I think that's, that's too naive, I would say. Yeah? Uh, I mean, uh, I don't think that uh, I think if we want to change things, we also, I mean, we need political parties that conquer state power also and change the state from within. Uh, I mean, uh, 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 so I think we need a kind of progressive European-wide uh, movement uh, for media that takes up ideas of media reform uh, and uh, so on. And if they are in power, then they can uh, take a specific uh, reforms, uh, and uh, on the, I, think, I think on the one hand, uh, then, uh, I mean, what I would call the public service in internet should be more uh, advanced, but I would say maybe only for specific platforms, and maybe especially for those platform forms uh, that require a, a lot of storage capacities, uh, because storage is very uh, expensive, yeah? so for, for running something like YouTube, I mean, Google can do it because it's, uh, it, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a tremendously rich uh, company, uh, but a small civil society organization could not run something like, uh, you, like, uh, like YouTube, whereas public service uh, institutions yeah, that are state funded uh, via a license fee or whatever uh, are economically much more powerful and can do this. I mean, but the idea that you could also, for, for example, have uh, is, I mean, where, where did the internet come from uh, as, the, uh, as the upper net? I mean, it was this network uh, of, uh, of universities uh, ru uh, uh, running them. Uh, and why don't we also, not at the platform uh, uh, le uh, uh, level, try to uh, have pu uh, uh, public universities, especially 
technological universities together in a network uh, try to run some of these uh, some of these uh, platforms. So public universities and would exclude privately run uh, univers university, uh, but they would be very well suited uh, organizations for taking over or, or running uh, uh, parts uh, of uh, of uh, uh, of platforms. But this con I would say this concerns data. Uh, Platforms that are data intensive uh, for storage, it, it, or everything that con, uh, concerns video, probably, uh, and uh, so on. Whereas, I think those platforms that are involve a lot of personal data that can also be sensitive, uh, and of course, the data you, you upload on, uh, on, 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 on Facebook is very sensitive uh, data, uh, uh, partly. And I mean, I feel very uncomfortable that we hand this over to private companies. I mean, it, one, the most frequently mentioned word in our panel debate here was trust. Mm -hmm. So why do we trust these private, uh, these pri private companies? Yeah? And here I would also be critical and say, should we, can we trust the state? Although we also must differentiate that a public service broadcaster is not necessarily a state-run organization, because something like the BBC is quite an independent institution. I mean, it pr prides itself uh, as being independent uh, from uh, the, from the British government, yeah? so it's not it's not the same. So also, it would not necessarily m uh, mean if you have a public service uh, internet that this directly gives uh, the uh, state access uh, to the data. If the public service media organisations are truly independent media, and of course uh, this is one of their uh, of, the, of their core uh, uh, principles. It does not always work like this uh, in. Uh, practice, but at least uh, it, it's an idea. But for the, the, the platforms that are, uh, have a lot of sensitive personal data, I think the better model would be uh, that we have civil society platforms, something like Wikimedia and so on. But the thing about uh, Wikipedia is, I mean, it's such a successful platform, it's non-profit, does not use advertising, but you all know uh, this uh, sad face of Jimmy Wales uh, when uh, you see him uh, once in a while asking you give, give me some money. Yeah? And so the, the problem is also, and I mean the, the kind of, of funding model that media activists and also users like most is the donation model. Yeah? But it's also a kind of consumer model. Yeah? We are the consumers and then uh, we give some uh, money to the platforms that we like uh, and uh, consumes. But I mean Donation models are good, but they are also uh, 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 not so viable because what happens uh, if, the, if, the, if the flow of donations uh, s uh, s is suddenly broken? I mean, how much, and how much money can people donate? And uh, I mean, it has to do also with how high their incomes are. Yeah? So if, uh, and we know since the 70s, uh, income inequality has risen. Yeah? So it gets, is on the rise even more now uh, because of the crisis. So it gets, more difficult for people to donate a lot of uh, of money, yeah? and of course that's what a lot of civil society groups are, the, are facing the, uh, this problem. Which is why I think we need. Uh, why I, I mentioned this idea of what I would call the public sphere check, uh, where by, where you can combine civil society power and state power. Yeah? Because if we would introduce uh, the idea uh, of uh, a media uh, fee. Then of course uh, the state would take care uh, of uh, of uh, of, uh, 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 of enforcing uh, collecting uh, the fee from all citizens and especially also from companies. Yeah? So I mean, why do companies not pay a license fee? Why do only we, as citizens, pay it? Why don't companies also pay uh, a license fee, or I would call it then a media fee? That's the first question. And why are all over the world license fees flat? Why are they not like a progressive tax? Because you know, that's also why it's unpopular to pay a license fee. Yeah? It's, it's uh, quite unpopular everywhere uh, be because it's, it's flat. Yeah? But I mean, a flat fee always means that those who have higher incomes or higher revenues uh, are privileged. Yeah? If, you, if you make it progressive, like progressive income uh, tax, then those with low incomes pay no license fee or media fee. Those with high incomes, well, pay uh, much more than, uh, than, uh, than others. Christian, you, I, I would like to... Yes, to one sentence. And if you enforce this via the state, 
then you can, uh, via participatory budgeting, give the money to all citizens, all European citizens, uh, and they can donate it. So, but then it's a, but, but they cannot donate it, they must donate it to a non-profit media organization. Uh, and then uh, a lot of organizations are solving this resource pro uh, uh, pro uh, problem. And also we have the idea of the donation model that is very, po uh, very popular, but it's more, it gets more viable simply. But for doing this, we also need the state. Uh, that's Thank why. You very much for this uh, thought of uh, answered and thought provoking as always. And uh, I would like to see if there are any more questions, please. My name is Heidi Pence. I'm a lobbyist against uh, data reten retention and uh, a lobbyist for the unconditional basic income. Um, I wanted to thank you, especially Christian Fuchs, for the suggestions you have had. And I feel a little embarrassed that I'm not giving more to Wikipedia. So from tomorrow, I'm going to triple it at least because I have a job where I can afford it till we have this uh, media fee, including the corporations. Uh, thank you very much, Mina Samatas. Um, I had no idea what was going on in your country. And uh, thank you very much, Miyase Christensen. I like the suggestions. Uh, whistleblowing on a smaller scale is important as well, which you mentioned in the beginning. And thanks to Pepi Zawodzki from tomorrow, I will encrypt my emails <laughs> and I will do it by encrypted emailing. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, please. <laughs> Uh, there is a. Do you have a yes, question? Yes, yes, can I? Yes, please. <laughs> yes. I'm Jose Maria Diaz. I belong to, to Transform, the University of Leon and in Munich, and work in interdisciplinary studies of information. And I would like to pose a question regarding something that I feel is very important. So, what you have posed uh, about how to overcome this uh, stage of capitalism. Uh, that is uh, posing a lot of contradictions in the in the system, but I think that what we actually need is some subject that is able to make these changes, and uh, and what I am observing is that we are actually thinking about the subject at the level of the state, whereas the changes in the capitalism sphere has gone to the international level, and uh, and if in order to really face this is at least my thinking, uh, to really face and to cope with this international organization of capitalism, which in any case it has always worked in an international level, but the role of the state has changed significantly in the, la in the last decades. We need a different subject, and this subject has to, to articulate in an international level and my question is uh, how concerning so the problems of the of the media and the problems of surveillance and so on could we build this kind of international platform thank you very much for your question and i would like to invite uh, more panelists to contribute to the discussion because we have a limited time now and i would like to hear uh, yeah uh, Yes, one more question, please, yes. Um, my name is Yasmin Engelhardt. I'm a student uh, of science and technology studies here at the University of Vienna. And I would like to ask a question to uh, Ms. Christiansen. Um, as you were talking about your research about, uh, when you were talking to people about their opinions of surveillance, you said that they were more concerned about uh, video surveillance, but not so much about surveillance of uh, communications. Um, do you think that this has anything to do with uh, the fact that you can see video cameras physically and that it's very easy to perceive these things, okay, this is there, this is surveilling me, and, uh, but you cannot really see that people are capable of seeing your, or reading your communications, and do you think that it would change if people had the possibility to uh, yeah, kind of experience uh, how this can really work, how people can really intercept their communications. Do you think that this would make a difference? Would you like to... Yes, one, one last question, please. Thank you. My name is Andrzej Kolkaj from Slovakia. I have a question to Sebastian Savignano. 
actually maybe more questions, but there is no time. So you mentioned the need for decommodification of privacy and rethinking of privacy. And also instead of invoking the privacy framework as it stands. And just wonder because there is a lot of criticism about data protection directive and e-commerce directive in European Union and data protection privacy uh, directive especially was also challenging in Germany. In my country it is very problematic also because it's too broad. So what is the problem in your perspective with these uh, directives and what would you suggest instead of these uh, directives? Thank you. Uh, would you like to start with the first question? Uh, I don't know if this. Thank you for the questions. I will start with the last one about people's perceptions of um, camera surveillance versus um, mobile devices, for instance. Yes, definitely. Since they are so integral to our lives, we kind of tend to see them as, as persons, in a way, so to speak. So sort of like member of the family are mobile phones and we internalize them. Whereas camera is still external, it's out there and we associate it with top-down, especially state surveillance. It's also, it, all, it, all, it also has to do with the fact that it has been sort of um, talked about as such in popular discourse, popular culture, camera surveillance. Whereas we do not want to think about the implications that come with mobile um, applications. Not that we are incapable of understanding the complexity of that, some of us do, but we kind of tend to ignore that to be able to use these devices. And that's why, that's why awareness, as you talked about it, is extremely, extremely important. Uh, because there's more to it than catches the eye or we might not know about. And to address the question before that about um, what to do about um, capitalism, international capitalism, and how to, how to grapple with these questions, well, I think there are several things that could be quickly pointed out. The fact that a lot of these decisions are made by non-elected bodies like the EU Commission or WTO. So we need to have the state more on our side than on the side of uh, the corporate power. But r what we have right now is not the case, unfortunately. So it's not just that we need civil society organizations and, and, and um, advocacy groups. We certainly need those, but we also need to have the state uh, more on our side than on the corporate side. And to give less power to these non-elected bodies like the EU Commission and, and, and WTO, et cetera. So we can address certain problems at a micro bottom-up level, but we need a lot more than that. We need um, we, just, we don't just need reform, I would say we need revolution to reverse um, the situation and the problem. Thank you very much, Miyase. Um, maybe, Sebastian, you would like to respond to the question? Yeah. Um, so I, I would say I would prefer the uh, European approach in contrast to the, the American approach to privacy. So there's, um, there's a lot more... Um, yeah, there, there, is, there is this understanding that uh, it is uh, a social issue. Privacy must be, uh, it's not an individual issue, but it's a social issue. Society should uh, protect it. And so that's, that I, I would prefer this tendency, but as you know, there's also, um, yeah, the, the, the EU directive is, is um, yeah, a, a lot of lobbying was, was um, was there and uh, now it's it's really really um, made uh, yeah in favor of, of corporations. Now th this is a problem also with w with this approach. And then more generally, I would say um, it is not enough to rethink privacy. It's also to um, to 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 um, I think it's needed to um, to react privacy. Because I, I assume that there is a cor correspondence between the, the way we organize our society and the way we um, we um, we are in capitalism. That's, that is what a possessive individualism expresses. That uh, it is useful in our society to 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 think like we are individuals uh, separated from the others and have private property which uh, is exclusive and and so on. And therefore, a rethinking of privacy. Can also uh, must be uh, accompanied by uh, these practical alternatives. Uh, yeah. So, so 
basically that is, is not enough to, to have this, this law. I, I prefer this in, in contrast to other approaches to privacy, um, but it, it's not enough. Thank you very much, Sebastian. And uh, because we are l running late, um, there was another question, but it has to be responded at a later point, maybe during the lunch break. And since yesterday, given the fact that there are here quite a few um, journalists, uh, there have been some questions uh, regarding also the journalism and, and media censorships uh, and as well as surveillance issues. Okay, the questions are, what do we do now? A lot of people asked, we know about the problems, you told us again about the problems, and what do we do now? So I would like to tell you that the fourth and last panel of our conference is devoted exactly to this purpose. There will be a different set of speakers who will provide with some uh, ideas on uh, strategies on how we come along this, to these problems. So thank you very much uh, for your input and th thank you very much for your attention and participation.